Namaste and good morning. I, Chavi Jain, researcher at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabhav Evam, Niti Anusandhan Sansthan, Nai Delhi, extend my warmest welcome to you all to IMPRI, <laughs> hashtag web policy talk. Today, we have gathered here for a special lecture on public policy drivers by Shri Bhartendra Singh Baswan. This discussion is a part of the series Hashtag Public Policy, organized by IMPRI, Center for Human Dignity and Development. We are deeply honored to have Dr. Nivedita Haran as the chair for today's lecture. Ma'am is a retired IS officer and former additional chief secretary, government of Kerala. Ma'am joined the Indian Administrative Service in 1980 and has held senior positions with government of India as District Collector and District Magistrate, Trivandram, and Secretary of uh, Agriculture, Government of Kerala. She also served as the Civil Affairs Officer, UN Peacekeeping Mission in Kosovo from September 2000 to December 2005. Ma'am has been responsible for many innovations in good governance and has a stellar reputation as an effective reformer and harbinger of modernity and change. Under her charge, District Parthana Metha was declared polio free. Ma'am has led the policy affairs team for finalizing the master plan of Delhi and drafting the urban development policy for the national capital region. We welcome you, ma'am. With the permission of our chair, I would now like to introduce our speaker for today, Shri Bhartendra Singh Baswan. Sir is a retired IS officer and former secretary at Department of Secondary and Higher Education, Ministry of Human Resource Development, Government of India. Sir started his career in IAS in 1967 in Madhya Pradesh. And during his career, Sir has held many important positions such as Director, Indian Institute of Public Administration, Secretary, Department of Secondary and Higher Education, MHRD, as well as Director at Lal Bahadur Shastri, National Academy of Administration, Masudi, besides many more. After his retirement from the Indian Administrative Service, so has been in the Results Framework Document Team for the Cabinet Secretary, Member or Chair of some official committees, Chairman at Lawrence School, Lovedale, and the De Delhi Public Library, member of the board of UNDP at Kabul to train Afghan civil servants in 2010. So also served as the fellow Singapore Institute of Arbitrators, senior consultant at Planning Commission, Government of India, and the chairman of the committee appointed by the Government of India to review recruitment to the higher civil services in the country. So current work in public policy is in public policy and so speaks on it at various forums in the country in addition to his research. A very warm welcome to you, sir. We're privileged to have you join us this morning. Thank you, Our discussions for today are Professor <clears throat> Jyoti Chandramani and Professor Sanjeev Chadda. Professor Jyoti is a director at Symbiosis School of Economics and Dean at Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences Symbiosis International, Pune. Professor Sanjeev Chadda is professor and head up at Management Development Center, Mahatma Gandhi State Institute of Public Administration, Government of Punjab. We welcome you, sir and ma'am. Now, I invite our chair, Dr. Nivedita P. Haran, to proceed with the deliberation. We look forward to learning from our esteemed gathering. Thank you, ma'am, and over to you. Thank you, Chavi. Good morning to all of you. It's a pleasure and an honor to be chairing this session today. And I think uh, which is not mentioned, uh, but which I have to uh, mention here is that Mr. Baswan, I was trained under Mr. Baswan. Uh, when I was a, a probationer trainee at Missouri, I remember him coming to Missouri to uh, take classes on, especially on the civil services conduct rules. 
And I still remember those classes. So, so it's a pleasure to be able to reconnect with you and to- Likewise, to Nivedita, you were in the AR wing, I think as well. I was, I was, yes, sir. Uh, so thank you so much. And thanks to Professor Arjun for giving me this opportunity. Uh, I uh, am here basically to listen to and to learn from Mr. Baswan's uh, talk today. And therefore I will not take time initially. I may raise a few questions and clarifications later, but I'm eagerly waiting to listen to uh, Mr. Baswan. And therefore, sir, you have been introduced and over to you for your talk. Thank, thank you, Nivedita and friends uh, for having me over. Uh, public policy, of course, everyone has a view on public policy and on how governments should be run. Every so before, citizen- Sorry uh, to is, interrupt. So is the volume you, okay? Uh, volume is okay, but your camera is again, uh, okay, it's showing it's just up. your forehead. Is this better? Yeah, this is much better. Yeah. Oh, right. Absolutely, I know because, uh, so anyway, um, public policy is obviously how, um, how governments uh, are meant to be guided. And um, it's not really rocket science, but policy is determined by interest groups. And uh, I'll confine myself to democracies because dictatorships are generally, uh, well, they also regard public opinion very well and they, uh, they cannot cross, cross certain lines. But in a democracy, public policy is basically the interaction of different forces, different lobbies, and uh, a lot of other factors, including ideology. Uh, to put it briefly, I see three public policy drivers. The first is ideology. Now, an ideology provides an intellectual framework. It gives you your ideas. It um, uh, gives you a roadmap. But any ideology, any dogma, I believe, uh, while it provides a proper framework, it can and often does become a substitute for thinking. If I have a rigid ideology, I tend to stop thinking. I, uh, I follow what is called a willing suspension of disbelief. I believe in something. And I believe that beliefs can be disastrous because if you believe that this is the right way to do things, you close your mind. And therefore ideologies can be extremely harmful of any kind, whether religious, whether economic, right or left, whether ecological, you have all kinds of forms of fundamentalism, which tend to, uh, you know, tend to erode uh, 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 an, uh, democracy and it tends to be inefficient as well because the absence of application of mind is something which is quite common. Now, most, uh, the, the first, this is the first driver. The second driver is rent seeking or corruption. Now you have to have a very broad definition of what corruption is. <clears throat> a, a, a colleague who was corrupt defined corruption as a flow of capital from the less deserving to the more deserving. But the fact is that it's either the taking of presents or favors, favor trading is a part of corruption. And I'll include what all democracies follow. And therefore, to some extent, they are all corrupt, that their main aim is to get reelected. And that, for that itself distorts policy. The third driver derives from the second. It's populism, uh, what the Americans call pork barrel politics, what we in India call vote bank politics. And you have policy capture by interest groups. I'll also briefly talk about the social sector because the social sector tends to get crowded out in the budgetary process, largely on account of a Mavlovian uh, uh, hierarchy of needs. Um, because for the simple reason that um, uh, uh, Maslowian, because the voter wants immediate results and that tends to harm the long-term interest of any nation. What I'll do very briefly is just flag the important events of the last hundred years and just see how these, these are global events to see how they've impacted on public policy on the, in the world and on India in particular. <clears throat> 1921, 
was the end of the world. Obviously, uh, uh, the uh, uh, it, it, by then the world had seen uh, a devastating war. The maps of the world were redrawn. The Austro-Hungarian Empire, which you and would be familiar with, and um, the uh, entire Middle East, the Ottoman Empire. Countries were created. The Middle East countries were created by two bureaucrats with a pencil and paper. They redrew the map. They created all the countries in the Levant, most of them. And then the British and the French obviously established themselves in the Middle East. I'm mentioning this because it has a bit of relevance later on. Given the remaining, because I started at 1110, so in all, I, I wouldn't, uh, I'd definitely stop by 1140 at the latest, because that will be my half hour, which is, which is the absolute ceiling. The, uh, the first event post-war and you know, the treaty is not just of Versailles, but of Trianon and the uh, rise of, uh, uh, you know, of, of Kamal Ataturk helped uh, change things a little bit. But the fact was that the world was rearranged. We came through the Spanish flu as well. And then the, the next great event was obviously the Great Depression. Now, the Great Depression um, actually taught us one lesson. It was capitalism's biggest, biggest disaster. Because uh, when, as all, all of you know, when consumption and investment dry up, there has to be government intervention or Sarkari Kharcha. The Keynesian intervention did help a little bit. The uh, Ramsey McDonald government did put in investment across the Atlantic. FDR had his new deal. But the ultimate Keynesian intervention was World War II, which has not been uh, emphasized enough. World War II, a war is a wonderful thing in, in the, probably the best way to end uh, a recession. Full employment. The US had uh, a lot of prosperity at that time. Uh, it's surprising that the economic growth rates you know, soared. So uh, war is a very disastrous thing at one level, but as a stimulus, it's certainly uh, important. But the fact was that it effectively ended the depression. So World War II was obviously the, the next event. After World War II, we had the, uh, uh, the end of colonialism as well as the Cold War. The Cold War meant that you had armed camps, colonial governments, obviously, it was in their interest to vacate. We did have a freedom a movement, and it was a powerful movement. It was handled very well. I think the nonviolent movement was appropriate at the time. And yet, we didn't sacrifice. The, not enough sacrifices were really made by our citizens. It was given to us on a platter, as it were, independence. It was no longer viable for the British to hang around here. That was fairly clear. So it came to us. And when it came to us, it came at a time when our own, we had a certain infrastructure, but Indian industry was obviously weak because of a colonial pattern. And the result was that the Indian industrialists themselves demanded uh, uh, state intervention, the Bombay and the Nagpur resolutions. So when, uh, uh, and Pandit Nehru obviously was a socialist, that was his upbringing. He was close to the Fabian movement. And every thinking person after 1929 had to be a leftist. So that became the prevailing ideology. I regard socialism as the noblest ideology, um, takes everything into account except human nature. And therefore, I believe it, it's not sustain, sustainable in the long term unless it's supported by a brutal dictatorship. That doesn't mean socialism is uh, irrelevant. Uh, basically, it's relevant as an important uh, tool and uh, an instrument of public policy, as is, um, uh, as is, um, sorry, uh, just a minute, huh? as is uh, capitalism or uh, monetarism. These are instruments, they are all relevant, but to follow any ideology would, to my mind, be a bit of a mistake. I mentioned this because after we became independent, we had the Industry <clears throat> Development and Regulation Act, 
where people were punished for producing more. I argue that India's greatest socialist was not uh, M. N. Roy, but Ganshyam Das Birla, because he benefited the most from Indian socialism. I worked in the, in, in the industry ministry during the license permit raj. And the main Udyog in Udyog Bhavan was the photocopying of our documents after dark. Um, lobbying was very frequent. Liaison officer would photocopy our note sheets and throw them to us the next day. I said, I'll give it to you. Why do you, why do you photocopy it? He said, Nay, I'm a safety ko chori kamal pasand there. So the fact was that um, this was the prevailing position where lobbying took place. And when lobbying took place, obviously money changed hands. The presiding deities was very often the minister concerned and it's rumored that the money went right up to the top. Now, this is not really a, a complete morality lesson, but these are just faults in public policy. And the license permit Raj effectively ended in 1991, at least in Udyog Bhavan. And the reason why it went through was not because people wanted it. The, the politicians didn't want it. The bureaucracy didn't want it. The businessmen had a very cozy arrangement because they were selling substandard goods at a high cost to a captive audience. There were barriers to entry and exit. And uh, the trade unions, the judiciary, the academia had a kind of ideological overhang um, because of the uh, uh, prevailing belief that state intervention was desirable. But it happened, and when it happened, obviously India did grow. But ideologies obviously have their limitations. Today, the political debate has been somewhat vitiated because either you're described as uh, you know, uh, a bhakt or an anti-national. And there seems to be no middle ground. We need to be analytical about all governments, whether UPA or NDA. They have their strong points. They have their weak points. As far as the present government is concerned, the two weak points are obviously one is you cannot really rule a country if you exclude a minority, if you are not fair to them, if you are perceived as being communal in order to get votes. That's a weak point. The other is which, which has in common with the Congress party is the erosion of democratic values. Whenever an Indian uh, parliament has a large majority, it happened in Mr. Gandhi's time, it was terrible. It happened in Rajiv Gandhi's time as well as happening right now in Mr. Modi's time, that then opponents of the government are harassed, they're labeled as anti-nationalists and the misuse of authority is certainly uh, quite common. Um, someone asked me about the CBI's role. It's so the CBI's role, apart from anything else, is to um, bring recalcitrant politicians to the negotiation table. So the idea of getting, uh, using the agencies obviously is not uh, good, but there are a lot of other things that the government have thought about and are doing quite well. I personally supported the uh, farm bills, even though they were they were badly handled, ran through without any consultation. Nothing wrong with the bills, I believe. Uh, labor laws as well. Um, GST, a lot of credit is deserved. Uh, alertness on the defense front. All of that, I think, is very good. Technology, Swachh Bharat. There are a lot of commendable initiatives as well. So we needn't rush to judgment or condemn any particular government. And civil servants are, I believe, expected to be neutral, not only when they're in service, but even afterwards. And I would certainly frown on civil servants um, joining politics as well. It happens in other countries. In France, as you know, that every single president and prime minister, with two exceptions since World War II, has been a civil servant, including Emmanuel Macron. But uh, uh, I remember telling the French that if there's a next French Revolution, the guillotine will be on the left bank of the river uh, where the bureaucrats are. But Mr. Macron has applied the guillotine to the bureaucracy by abolish, abolishing NR. So even that country is gradually changing. Now, coming back to India, you had an inefficient state control. Pandit Nehru's vision was justified at that time. Maybe we should have moved to the right 
by the early 1960. We needed that infrastructure, but we didn't. Because Mrs. Gandhi's survival depended on her, partly the ideology and partly a survival instinct. So she obviously embraced the left. And uh, this proved to be uh, somewhat harmful to the economy uh, in the long run. The emergency was an aberration, but I believe our democratic structures are strong enough to withstand all these uh, buffeting forces. Coming back to the narrative about the major events in the world, uh, end of colonialism, the Cold War, and the Cold War, like many unsustainable systems actually uh, fell uh, under its own weight, but uh, credit must be given to Mr. Gorbachev because he went out of his way and with glasnost and perestroika, uh, things changed and changed in some respects for the better. But what the China, and, and as far as China was concerned, the rise of China is another event which took place along with the end of the Cold War. In fact, a little earlier than the Cold War ended because uh, Chairman Mao's uh, big mistakes in the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution really damaged his country. But then with the Deng Xiaoping's reform from 1979 onwards, things changed dramatically. Uh, Chairman Deng in a very simple, uh, in a simple phrase, simply abolished communism on the land. To give you just a rough analogy, if I'm a farmer and I'm required to give 90% of my produce to the commune, I'll probably stop working. Uh, the uh, reformists in China uh, put, uh, turned the equation upside down. I kept 90% and I gave 10% to the government. The result was that agriculture and production in China doubled in virtually three or four years. And the uh, that enabled them to focus on industry and the growth of China is one of the major events uh, in the 20th century. The um, Cold War, of course, came to an end and these countries came about, although right now, the, uh, this led to a unipolar world till China asserted itself. Today, we have a new kind of Cold War, but ideas and ideologies change very little. Many people believe that the Cold War is not ended and foreign ministries tend to be a little conservative because of the mindset where they believe that the Cold War is important. Non-alignment was a balancing act, it served a certain purpose, but today it is a national interest which has to be pursued, which means that countries have to be flexible in their foreign policy, which I think to some extent they are being. As for, as, so ideology, and religious ideology will, I believe, be harmful. It may be a way of getting votes, but any, any religion which excludes the others, religious violence, rel religious intolerance, is something which we have to deal with and deal with firmly. If we don't do that, any government would lose credibility. The, um, uh, the, nine, the 20th century, had most of these events, but the 21st century has had three major events. I'd say the first was 9-11. Now, when you look at Islamic anger, as it were, you need to take a look at the largest picture, the larger picture. Um, the great civilizations of the uh, eight, seven, eighth and ninth centuries were basically the uh, Tang dynasty in China and the uh, Abbasid Caliphate in Baghdad. We need to remember that the most civilized part of the world was Arabia and was Baghdad, particularly under Harun al-Rashid. It was the center of learning, the best brains went over there and it was a kind of high water mark in Islamic civilization. So that sent decline, in a sense, the, the, the feeling of anger probably took place, took place a little earlier at the uh, defeat of the Isla Moorish armies in Tour uh, Poitiers in 70, 732. And um, this feeling of loss has been there. This was aggravated by the loss of Andalusia al-Andalus in 1492, the year Columbus uh, 
sailed across the Atlantic um, with the loss of Andalusia in Spain by the Moors. And of course, the Ottoman Empire uh, revived was a time of revival and its end only had symbolic significance. But the fact was that the Middle East, uh, with the discovery of oil in the 1930s, the British had the good sense to cultivate the House of Saul right from World War I. And when oil was discovered, you had oil politics and you had the Anglo-Americans coming into the Middle East and uh, capturing the oil resource. They were largely responsible for the death of an independent-minded Iranian Prime Minister Mossadegh uh, as well. So oil, oil politics had a hand in it. When we look at the, back, uh, the background of 9-11, we found that uh, the Soviet Union, which uh, was in a sense, uh, uh, you know, had, had a very high threat perception, and uh, they, when they invaded Afghanistan, the Americans, the Saudis, and the Pakistanis obviously pulled out all the stops. Osama bin Laden is probably the creation of the Americans, and it's not the it's not the last time that they did it. It was uh, 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 Prime Minister Maliki and the American ambassador who helped create uh, ISIS and Baghdadi as well. So we tend to make these mistakes. We ourselves arm the LTTE uh, and uh, we trained them, we taught them how to fight. And then we got a bloody nose when we went in because we were taken for a ride by President Jayavardhana of Sri Lanka. And again, that was a disaster. So these mistakes are made by governments and uh, governments are certainly not infallible. But interest groups are important. My generation, uh, my, con my contemporaries and some friends for, were drafted in the Vietnam War. Some prominent names were draft dodgers. But the fact was that many people believed that the Americans were saving the world from uh, uh, a communist takeover, as it were. But the Vietnam War was largely guided by the military industrial complex. And when we look at 9-11, we find that the Americans had probably no choice to come in as uh, taken two rounds of Afghanistan and seen that country. It's, uh, you get the most hospitable people. It's a remarkable country in many ways. And yet uh, the Taliban at that time probably had to be evicted, so they were. But then a uh, degree of natural regression take place because they had nothing to replace it with. They weren't prepared to walk the talk. But there was some justification. But there was no justification for Iraq, uh, or Gulf War II in particular, where um, uh, Saddam Hussein, for all his faults, was secular. There was no question of Al-Qaeda rearing its head. But the oil lobby, the arms lobby, the construction lobby, and the supply lobby virtually captured the US policy. There were no weapons of mass destruction. So ideologies across the world do have, a, uh, have an impact. And interest groups in this case have virtually captured policy. So policy capture is very often the rule rather than the exception. Now in India, what happened was that um, we did abolish the license permit raj in industry, but there was government control. And um, uh, the uh, windows or the opportunities for corruption uh, did remain. Um, and even a department like, uh, say, MHRD, suppose I am the education minister and my aim is to make as much money as possible. Uh, what do I do? What I do is I first get the, uh, change my advisory group and I get the country's best academics people of integrity, knowledge, uh, the left academics. Because uh, very often people say that a right-wing uh, intellectual is an oxymoron. But whatever it is, uh, the, um, the left-wing do provide an intellectual framework. But what happened was that the left became an instrument of corruption. Because, uh, and I as a minister who wants to make money, I rely on the left intellectuals who have credibility. They tell me I must have more government control. And I said, yes. Then what I do is I consult uh, 
the state governments. Now, they want control as well. So the result is I tell the government, tell my colleagues that, look, we must have more state control. Then, what, then more powers are given to the regulators. Then what I do is I have a partnership with the regulators. I say, look, now the regulators, they let me be honest, but number two or number three will collaborate with me. So once I have more control, I'm able to extract rent. And um, uh, for bigger customers, I send my nephew to negotiate. So the negotiate, the nephew goes to the private education providers, the technical colleges. And he says, my uncle's mood is very bad. So he said, what do I do to make his mood good? He said, so what happens is that uh, very often avenues are created because money making is almost built into politics, but they have different connotations. Uh, we had Birla who benefited the most, but looking at the reliance phenomenon, people say that, look, does reliance own the government? Now, this was in, uh, in UPA too. He was influential, yes. He, uh, many officers got their positions on account of seeking his blessings, even though Dhirubhai was a very uh, wise person. He, people said he should have been jailed, maybe, but he also deserved his Padma Vibhushan because he created the share market. The uh, AGM at the Cooper Aid Stadium was a major event. It virtually modernized our economy in many ways because people then realized that markets mean something and that change change for the better. So it's very difficult to pass judgment as the Bible says, judge not lest ye be judged. And there is this degree of uh, moral ambiguity. Uh, the greatest instrument of empowerment of the Indian people is this cell phone. More than anything else, this has empowered Indians. And we have to understand how it really came about. The Rajiv Gandhi government, people like Mr. Vittal, the um, role of Sam Petroda, they were all important. But the prime mover was, in, in my view, Pandit Sukra. Now, Pandit Sukra was accused and probably rightly accused of corruption, but he turned out to be a great reformer because what he did was he was transparent in what he did. He virtually auctioned, he said, Aap kitne de sakte hai, uh, to a group of people. Having done that, he became a stakeholder for reform. He's regarded as a god, incidentally, in, in uh, Mandi. So what he did was he enabled us to develop uh, you know, to, to cash in on the mobile phone phenomenon and later the smartphone. The other reformer was Mr. Raja because he uh, was accused of uh, selling Spectrum cheap, which he probably did, not one, one lakh 86,000 crores as the CAG pointed out. That's probably not true. It's an exaggeration. But having done that for reasons of his own uh, and maybe for the party, but the fact is that he sold Spectrum cheap. And many of you would remember the Airtel, the Nokia advertisements, where the phone rings, the head barber picks up his phone, not his, or the customer, but the Mundu brings chai. So therefore, today, almost anyone can afford a cell phone. Now, at the moment, uh, if you look at our growth rates, they did improve after 1991. Will they... Uh, improve further. I believe they will. COVID, the second uh, great event of the 21st century was obviously the financial crisis. But that has shown that many governments have used both uh, socialist and uh, monetarist instruments to fine tune the economy. So we might see ideology uh, taking a backseat actually. You have to be flexible and use different ideological tools to fine tune your policy. And uh, rent seeking in many ways will continue, but I think that uh, with, uh, uh, you know, with uh, um, e-governance, with um, the right to information, with public awareness, things uh, I believe should improve. The social sector tends to get crowded out because these are long gestation, low visibility investments. I tried to have Secretary of Social Justice and Tribal Affairs as well as Education. I lobbied with the members of Parliament for more funds. 
And they said, we sympathize with you, but we can't support you. So I said, why not? He said, dekhiye sahab, amara time frame panch saal ka hai. Vote hum kis cheez se milta hai? Roti, kapda, makan, rojgaar, bijli, sadak, pani. Education, health, welfare, long gestation, low visibility investments. Hai. We don't get enough votes for that. So this is probably one reason why the social sector was crowded out. But to be fair to both coalition governments, they put in more money in education and now post-COVID, they would certainly, which is the third great event of the century, they will certainly invest more in health. So I see there's no reason to be pessimistic. And uh, as far as COVID is concerned, we have Omicron at our doorstep. Uh, uh, it may be milder. We don't know, know enough about it. But it's probably better to be cautious. We may have, may, government may have mishandled part of the COVID uh, crisis, but credit must be given to them and, of course, to the producers for a, a very competent uh, vaccination rollout. I've spoken, uh, I, it's now 11.40, so I'll stop over here. It's open for questions, no matter how awkward, and that's my job, and no matter how you know, silly you think it is, please go ahead. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. It was, uh, it was a pleasure listening to you. You have very lucidly uh, explained the, the, the factors of uh, public policy drivers and uh, giving us a worldview, comparing it to, the, to what, is hap what has happened historically over the world and now and what has happened in India. So thank you very much. As you rightly said, uh, public policy is a function of various factors. It's a, it's a function of the political, the socio-political, the economics uh, status and situation in the country, the, the, the financial position of the country, the mindset of the people, the, the, the powerfulness of the, of the, the, the so-called uh, the groups, the pressure groups, and the lobbies that are functioning there. And of course, very important, it is also a function of the efficiency of the bureaucracy. And uh, I think uh, what has probably not uh, been given enough emphasis is this last part, because a public policy starts at the, at the back end with various of many of these factors. But at the front end, once a public policy is approved, uh, declared, the most important thing is to ensure that it gets implemented and enforced. Now, why is it that in India, this, uh, the enforcement has been uh, perhaps uh, not the best? And I think uh, you have given very various reasons for that. Uh, rent seeking tendency is a very important reason. Uh, but I, let me just uh, mention a few that have probably uh, given a fillip to it, which has ma made perhaps public policy uh, implementation and enforcement a little better over the last uh, seven or so decades that we have been independent. I think one has been the, uh, uh, the uh, transparency. Yes. I think uh, that has, uh, I from my experience, I feel that really helps. And coming from Kerala uh, and having served most of my life in Kerala, I find that, uh, and now living in um, NCR, I find the difference very stark. I find that one of the reasons that public policies and rules, regulations, <clears throat> laws emerging from those are probably enforced better in Kerala is because of the people's awareness Absolutely. and the people's ability Absolutely. to ask questions. But then you have also given, and in Kerala, it has probably happened because one of the reasons, primary reasons being the literacy amongst the people, Absolutely. Uh, which I find uh, terrible in UP. Um, uh, even um, uh, women of my, leave alone my age, yeah. even women in their twenties and thirties are still illiterate. They have gone to school. They have gone to school only up to the up to class maybe four or five, yeah. and they have again uh, reverted back into illiteracy. I think that is something that uh, bureaucrats need to probably uh, put it as as a as a as a push, uh, because as you rightly mentioned, that it is never a political uh, priority. 
because it's not a vote earner. And therefore, uh, we need not expect that to happen, but it is important. The second thing perhaps that has, uh, has been helping us is some bit of uh, uh, rational, rationality and rationalism in the procurement system. I think much of the corruption and rent seeking took place, at least at the high end, was in the procurement system. But now with technology coming in, I think that has had some impact and uh, it has probably uh, closed the, uh, the gaps that existed. But something that I want to mention, and I feel that uh, that could really have made a difference and could make a difference in the future would be uh, an area where I have been working and I uh, would also like uh, uh, Mr. Baswan to perhaps share his views on it, is this gap that exists between academicians and the intellectual, so-called intellectuals and the bureaucrats or, or administrators. I think that gap, which in countries like uh, France is more easily filled up because one hops from one to the other. In India, that does not happen. And the, and the chasm that is there often worries me because uh, when I attend conferences, I find there is, a, uh, there is a, always a strong undercurrent of bureaucr bureaucracy baiting. Uh, I had given this proposal. I had written that paper. I had shared this idea, but nobody did anything. The policy came out, but nobody even gave a thought to it. That is the attitude of the academicians. The bureaucrats are, you know, on, on the other hand, I, I have a very simple example. When we were drafting our policy, the solar policy, the alternate energy policy in Kerala, and I wanted to bring in as part of the committee, a couple of uh, uh, experts, scientists, uh, my bureau, bureaucrat colleagues said that don't bring them in. They will only take matters tangentially to another, to another direction. Uh, you will not even be able to tackle them. So you see that gap that, I know best and the other side does not count. I think that gap needs to be removed. And uh, one of the reasons I associate myself with IMPRI is because I feel that is one thing that Dr. Arjun has been doing. He's been trying in his own way to bring the, the two sides together so that they talk to each other and they also learn to argue with each other. After all, no, as you said, nothing is set in stone. We need to learn and get the best out of it. Finally, I want to mention something that you uh, very cogently said is about the public policies actually being made. Who is the uh, stakeholder? Uh, and does the stakeholder have a hand in drafting it, in putting in uh, information about it? Often no. For instance, the labor codes that have come out. And I say this because I'm closely associated with the, the, the problems of migrant, internal migration within the country, which is happening, uh, a lot of it from Bihar, Odisha, uh, Bengal, Assam to Kerala, and to other parts of the uh, southern states. Um, uh, I think that a lot of things, ha things have been missed out because the main stakeholders did not get a chance to put in their uh, their, their data, their suggestions, their information. I think that openness of mind uh, could take us a long way in improving our policy making and, yes. and, and accepting that the main drivers after all are the bureaucrats who are going to implement it and even more so the people who are going to be benefited from it or impacted by it. And that uh, involvement does not often come. And I think that should come, a, a good narrative could be built in that regard by organizations uh, that are working in this area, uh, like IMPRI, and uh, they could be the forum where the stakeholders would get a hand at expressing their views. Uh, for instance, it was very well done when we were doing the land computerization in Kerala. We got the people who were actually um, in no way connected to the government and, and in no way connected to bureaucracy. They were the, the so-called activists, the people who were in the field, and they came, the suggestions they gave proved to be the most uh, okay. potent. And they were the ones that we could really, that made a difference to our policy. 
So I think that uh, you have so uh, well brought out, and I think uh, something that the researchers who are listening to you today can do is uh, I'm sure they can pick up a few topics for their research from what you from the lecture that you gave today, because uh, a lot of it can be written down in a manner that would really um, lead to some improvement in our policies. After all, what is the aim? The aim is to ensure that we are better governed, the systems are better, are more robust, and that the people in our country get benefited from it. And um, I, uh, you mentioned about socialism. I, I laugh at what happened when I was in Kosovo and I had to deal with my American colleagues. And the moment I would mention either socialism or secularism, they would think I was using a bad word. And that was uh, quite shocking to me because I went, in my innocence, I went from uh, my 20 years in the civil service and I thought that these were the code words and these were the key words in my service and in my life, lifetime, but uh, that's the way of thinking. But I think in whatever way, in, in whatever words we call it, uh, the, the, the main aims of socialism and secularism, I think cannot be, are not negotiable. And I think uh, in a country like ours, uh, which has grown so well over the years, regardless of what the defects have been, we have in South Asia been the forerunners of a lot of development, of a lot of improvement that have not happened in many of the other countries in South Asia, uh, who became independent reasonably uh, late. Um, I think uh, we have to understand that uh, we have to improve ourselves. And one of the ways of doing it is to ensure that uh, we are able to tackle the problems that still exist and uh, we are all able to face them and improve upon them. So thank you, sir. Thank you very much. I think there are two discussions. Uh, let me go to them one by one. I think uh, Professor Sanjeev, would you like to come first? Yeah. Uh, so uh, now, uh, good afternoon, ma'am. Uh, Nivedita, ma'am, uh, Baswan, sir. Uh, my fellow discussant, uh, Professor Jyoti, uh, and Dr. Arjun and uh, Simi, who uh, invited me here. Uh, Baswan sir, uh, uh, very frankly, it was a pleasure listening to you, uh, your views about, uh, you know, how uh, the policy framework has come up and uh, uh, rather I would say uh, a very uh, practical viewpoint of, uh, you know, how policy is framed in terms of uh, uh, by the political parties along with the uh, permanent executives in terms of the ideology and uh, uh, there are interests involved and uh, the populism also, as you said, because uh, they are there for five years and generally they have to consolidate that vote bank also. Uh, so you very uh, rightly defined and uh, uh, the uh, ideology part wherein, you know, uh, the ideology is closeted in some form of sugar coating and it is then delivered and distributed and you also talked about uh, the colonial past and the coming up of UNO and then uh, how countries became independent and from uh, there into heavy industries to regulation, financial party. You covered a lot of things on this uh, wonderful topic. And now where does India stand today after LPG and uh, now coming up with digital age and uh, the new policy frameworks you also mentioned about telecom revolution, uh, then uh, the, uh, the GST, and all these rules and then uh, uh, apart from that also the farm laws, uh, which was uh, a good policy framework, but somehow uh, uh, we were not able to sell. Uh, someone said, uh, I was reading to think, I think uh, uh, Dr. Gurcharan, uh, he said that these, uh, he also said the same thing that the farm laws were good enough, but somehow, you know, the government was not able to sell because of the simple reason that whenever any policy and now I'm talking about the reforms, they have to come up. Uh, only 30% time should be uh, going into the uh, policy uh, formulation and 70% time should go into the policy implementation. And uh, the uh, now one more thing that was very striking about the farm laws and agitation that it is not the prerogative which Niveti Bhutta ma'am also talked about is uh, the stakeholder consultation. Somehow that was missing and uh, maybe the parliament, maybe the temple of all policy formulation but uh, the, the agitation has brought this to the mind 
that uh, only 800 people out of the entire country cannot be responsible for 130-35 crores. Though they may be representatives, mm -hmm. their mind also matters. And uh, uh, like ma'am was talking, that stakeholder consultation is a must. And uh, a very interesting point uh, brought about by ma'am in terms of, you know, that all uh, people, not only academics and administration, because we have the best of the human resources in the world. Had it not been the case, we would have not been, you know, all CEOs today, they belong to India, whether it is Microsoft, Google, uh, MasterCard, everyone, uh, uh, Indira Nui, all these people, they are from somehow connected to India. So we have the best and the best of technical and manpower is there, but the policy formulation, and you also talked about policy implementation being poor because of the simple reason that there is no stakeholder consultation and all people are in their silos. Uh, I was in a meeting uh, yesterday in government of India and then we were talking says even in Amrut, one secretary may not talk to the other one. So what is happening? What to talk about in academics and administrators, even in the same division, the, the civil servants and others may not talk about. One professor in one room may not talk to the other professor. So uh, I think when you talked about South Asia also, how the South Asian, uh, Southeast Asian, rather ASEAN yes. countries, they became giants and tigers because of one thing which I have noticed while traveling there in that they don't live in silos. Industry is very much connected to academics. Academics is very much connected to the uh, science. Science is very much connected to the uh, academician. So in this way, the policy framework and implementation becomes good. And ma'am raised a very valid point that what to talk about policy formulation, even the policy implementation is further more poor yes. uh, because we are very good on paper. Ma'am and sir, uh, you will believe with me that we have the best and the best of agencies, best and best of the laws available. But somehow, if you go on paper or on the ground, it was very, very poor. Take the case of, let's say, traffic implementation. Best of the laws, but India is number one country in terms of fatal deaths, in terms of the uh, traffic accidents on roads. Number one country. That is the dubious distinction we have. Only reason is that all are in their silos. We think, let us be best on paper, and then implementation will take care. And thereafter, the problem of corruption also comes up. That if I, you know, if I close my eyes, what will be my gain uh, uh, with this? So uh, all these uh, th things have come up uh, in a very, very uh, good way on such a topic as such. And I think this had one, uh, one or two points I'll uh, further add upon uh, to what you said is that uh, you policy pol uh, formulation uh, and especially reforms, they have generally come during the times of uh, crisis. World over, you would yeah. if you would go yeah. by, you would see that whenever there was crisis, policy reforms have been faster and they have been accepted also. In the case of India also, if you go by, let's say, talk about uh, uh, the United Nations coming up because we were in World War II and there was a lot of grievance. Then uh, the body like UN came up. In India, LPG came up. Even when you talk about planning commission and socialism came up because of the independence and uh, uh, the 50, I think, two, three million people we were killed in West, uh, West Pakistan and uh, the like division of India and LPG also. And you would also uh, have noticed that during the COVID crisis, a lot of uh, uh, so-called reforms. I mean, we cannot judge on this, but yes, the government pushed a lot of reform bills. One of them was also the uh, farmer bill. So maybe some people said that this was not the right time to push. But some uh, theorists, they said that this was the very good time to push because mm -hmm. everyone was very poor in terms of, you know, uh, the crisis was there and nobody was looking at it and then it could have just passed. So this is one thing. And other things, sir, uh, which you have mentioned generally, but I would like to just highlight and flag it is, is the reluctance of those people who have been, who are benefiting from the earlier policy. They are the ones who will put all kind of, you know, obstructions to bring about a policy reform. Uh, just take the case of LPG when there was there and then this Bombay group came about, uh, headed by Rahul Bajaj, who mm -hmm. said that uh, it is uh, uh, Mera Scooter, why would you go? Because Bajaj Chetak was selling like hotcakes. Mm -hmm. And uh, now see, when uh, LPG came about, uh, Bajaj Chetak had to close. Mm -hmm. So it is a different story that it became more competitive mm -hmm. and now Bajaj is producing the, uh, the most of the motorcycles in the world in the world. 
number of motorcycles in the world and india is roughly number one number two in terms of the uh, that way but otherwise they were not willing to change because as you rightly said unki dal roti badhiya chal rahi thi and they were not you know why would they invest more and uh, that way so uh, when we when you link tip and you certainly brought about you know digitization also smartphones Absolutely. how that is helping around and then one more thing sir that is the global part whenever i talk to my uh, i being in the ati of punjab administrative training institute all the officers i just tell them that your nokri now is not guaranteed whatever you may say now you have to perform and rather private sector today is better because maybe there they have just one motive that is the profit motive you earn something to the lala and lala will not shunt you out but in government profit motive may be one but you have to see in from other angles you have not to unruffle any feather and there could be even if you bring in profits maybe uh, what is the ways and means about all these aspect so that has that has become tougher and then in this world of digitization everything is in here whatever you do you are in kind of a naked it's glass uh, walls are out there somebody is seeing it and maybe somebody will use it when you are at the wrong end and that is what you brought in about you know ma'am also talked about cbis and eds and all those people who are recalcitrant how these agencies are uh, being used to this so all this this is a very complex issue but uh, thanks uh, uh, baswan sir and ma'am uh, how you brought about very beautifully in terms of you know very comprehensive in this talks about the the experience exposure uh, 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 i mean articulated you articulated it so well uh thanks uh, to this and this is what uh, i had to offer to thank you so much thank you sanjeev thank you thank you thank you professor sanjeev um the second uh, sir before you come in before you come in mr baswan i think uh, let's have the second discussant also professor jyoti chandiramani please go ahead professor jyoti a good day to all and uh, good good day to mr baswan uh, ms haran uh sanjeev and simi for having me here and of course uh, arjun we've been here a couple of times earlier uh today's talk really i like the way you know baswan sir talked about how you know policies evolve and even global factors work on it and when you talked about the world war 2 before that the great depression you brought in keynes you know keynesianism uh the in the 30s an immediate outcome of that was the bretton woods and how you know fixed exchange rates mm -hmm. and the entire economic structure of economies got shaped i think it was a very landmark uh, event that got evolved and that policies therefore often get evolved out of global circumstances uh but one of the things that we've seen is as likely put by by earlier speakers and you too that there are policies at galore but the outcomes are you know at times tardy the outcomes are flailing even this is something that uh, dr nivedita spoke about that you know there is everything there on paper but very often very little there you know that that comes into the implementation process so i think the time has come and i feel the global world today with the sdgs that we talk about has talked more about the philosophies of socialism um secularism leaving no one behind planet property people um, you know partnerships and prosperity i mean talking about it all in a way that you know at least the lowest the person at the margins have a certain livability that is there and i think this is the point that i'm going to talk to you and request you to give some inputs from your you know experienced um, notion on the sdgs that are there today presently uh in the indian economy context we have the sdgs that are mapped with our own sdg index which has evolved from 2018 with about 115 parameters by and by we've had uh you know uh, another thing that has come in which is the bare necessities index which got you know put into the economic survey of 2021 so i like you to respond to this particular question sir that have we created the framework of measurement because you can only look at progress of a policy 
uh, by measuring it and seeing how it moves. And the third thing is even the multidimensional poverty index, because we go down to the roti, kapra, or makan right from the 70s, garibi, hatao, or two, I remember when we, I'm an urban economist, so when we talk about JNNURM, in Maharashtra, it used to be looked at when we would go on field, it would be looked at as, you know, gutter water meter, you know, at that point of time, that was another way because you need sewerages, etc. And um, then, of course, another point I'd like you to uh, respond to, sir, is marketing of a policy. Uh, you know, marketing of a policy happens, I think the Swachh Bharat mission, it's not as if this was not talked about before. It was given a different name, but it was never marketed because I think there was an embarrassment that you head towards the 70th year of independence and you still have open defecation in the 2011 census of 600 million people. So you really have to market a response to get it effective. Uh, the third thing that I'd like you to respond to is the, the timeliness. How, how effective is a policy supposed to be? And, uh, you know, post-1991, uh, you had the Narasimhan Committee Report 1 and 2 talking about, you know, the uh, amalgamation and consolidation of the banking system. And uh, that has happened. And today, what was talked about in 1992 and 97 is happening today in 2022. So, does policy effectiveness have a three decade lag is my question to you, because I think then there is the economics of time that we have lost in this amalgamation process. And uh, um, you, you, these were a couple of uh, areas. Again, you know, is it a failure in terms of, um, you know, on the environment front, Delhi is known to be the most polluted capital in the world. And actually, I've read an article saying that move the capital out of the, of Delhi, you know, <laughs> I mean, which is absolutely a different way of looking at it. So then is that a case of policy failure yeah. when you're not, when, when you are poised to be the third largest nation in the world in due course of time, whatever we do, we are going to be there at some point. But then how do you address Delhi, which is one of the most polluted capitals? And something that has been talked about again since the 90s from the center of, you know, uh, science and environment, CSE has been raising these issues and it has gone up to the Supreme Court even at that point. So rather than me speak more, I'd, re I'd like you to respond to my questions. And um, are we a flailing state in policy realization? You know, so thank you so much. And thank you, Nivedita. Thank you, Professor Jyoti. Uh, Mr. Baswan, how would you like to go about it? I, I, can, yeah. I could see that you were noting down the points. So uh, would you like to take some of the important ones one by sure. one? I'll, I'll, I'll certainly react to them, uh, Nivedita, okay. one by one. And um, I'll do it quickly, provided we have, Arjun has given us permission to cross his deadline of 12 noon. So can we continue? Then I'll I respond. Think, I yes, think we can. yes, sir, yes, please continue. Okay. okay, right. Uh, let me... As they say, take them up, uh, add serious to it, as it were. So coming to you, Nivedita, you see, the, the thing is that, uh, as you, uh, you know, you, you very well pointed out, that uh, transparency and, the, in fact, the AR wing and the IT ministry between them did a lot of work on this. The Right to Information Act is certainly a game changer. Uh, in Missouri, we were involved with the drafting when people like, um, uh, you know, um, Justice Savant was also involved as well. Mr. Arun Shori was there. Um, uh, Nitya Ramakrishnan was there. Aruna Roy was there. Harsh Manda was there. And I inherited this from my predecessor, Dr. N.C. Saxena. So it was well drafted. And as, as a law, it was a good law. Implementation, of course, uh, it's been neglected. I think the present government have neglected it. They need to, you know, have a course correction on this. They need to strengthen the RTI because that means better governance. Uh, E-governance has made a world of difference. Um, whether you're, you want a passport, whether you want a driving license. So it will certainly make inroads into rent seeking. And technology is definitely one of the answers. And... Um, uh, land computerization is another one where you can get your records of and, and Kerala is a very unique uh, entity. 
Of course, the Keralites are by far the best educated. They also let the world know that they are. And um, we have a dig at Keralites by saying the Keralite. In Kerala, uh, they don't work. They don't allow anyone else to work. But the moment they cross the Kerala border, they are brilliant. So what happens is that, but now, even in, in Kerala, there's a resistance to migrant labor. But then trade unions oppose them. But trade union members are also human. They also have their price. They can be got around. So you had an informal system of migrants coming in. Because I believe that governments can win battles against the market. But the market will always win the war. The classic example is that of the Islamic revolution in Iran. That post-1979, cable TV was banned. And uh, they were strictly enforced cable dishes would be smashed and the users were locked up. But then, uh, you know, the religious police also have their price, they weakened. And today you have cable TV in every house in Iran. So what happens is that, and the, and the, and the Berlin Wall largely fell. I was in Berlin before the fall. And it was very, uh, it was apparent that, uh, you know, it would, uh, things would change. So uh, that's something which will always happen. Um, E-governance is critical. The gap between academia and bureaucrats, the point raised by Sanjeev as well as by you, that uh, they operate tend to operate in different silos. The bureaucrats, uh, are, we tend to be very arrogant. We say that academics are those who, you know, um, uh, I, all, you know, would be aspirants and so on and so forth. And uh, the, uh, bureau, the acad academics say that uh, bureaucrats only go by, um, you know, uh, basically they simply go by experiential evidence, uh, anecdotal evidence, they don't apply their minds and the truth might lie somewhere between the two. But the fact is that they need to talk to each other. Of course, let me have a dig at academics by saying that while we bureaucrats compete with each other, occasionally we stick a knife into each other. But academics are worse than us. They never have a kind word for their colleagues. And then they add later that his thesis is only a cut and paste affair. So, you know, the gloves are removed uh, even within professions and more so than <laughs> academia. Because you really come across an academic, you know, uh, having a kind word for a competitor. But apart from that, stakeholders is important. Labor is a stakeholder. And certainly you need to involve them in the labor laws. But the uh, Industrial Disputes Act was in fact, uh, had a deleterious effect. It needed to be amended in order to increase, uh, uh, you know, uh, and we talk about the farm aristocracy and the labor aristocracy. Both are aristocracies. The anti-farmer movement was largely led by the farm aristocracy. And uh, they were the prime movers. Internal migration, I'm glad you flagged this because I'll follow the Galbraithian hypothesis on migration. That migration blesseth him who giveth and him who receiveth. It helps both countries. But let us take the case of Punjab as a case where you had migrant labor coming in. Now gone are the days when early morning before the crack of dawn, the Punjabi farmer would wake up, he would uh, eat something in the morning, he would uh, have a few, a couple of liters of milk and, and take his stuff and go out into the field. Today, the Punjabi farmer has stopped working because the uh, mechanization is only one aspect. The labor comes from the generic term Bihar, which includes Bihar, Orissa, Eastern UP, Chhattisgarh, Madhya Pradesh, even some people from Assam come. So the fact is that uh, because the Punjabi farmer has himself stopped working. Therefore, we've traced the graphs of sale of drugs, of alcohol, of uh, medicines for heart disease and diabetes. They've grown in almost geometrical progression. So this has affected their social structure as well. So in the sense that uh, part of these dynamics is very interesting. So they want to go abroad and uh, become what the Punjabis call kabutars or fly away to other countries. And a lot of them fly into even Italy and Albania as well, other countries. And the guys over there want to go to the United States. So everyone wants to move in some way or the other. Um, 
Migration, I believe, is a good thing. It is also, while it supported the Naxal movement in Bihar, it made people in Bihar and Jharkhand aware of the injustices of their system by being well treated by the Punjab farmers. So the aspiration levels increase apart from their own role in agriculture and improvement of agriculture in the eastern states, which has been a positive fallout. Openness of mind is important. South Asia, yes. Southeast Asia, laughed, you know, they used to laugh at us and they left us behind in many ways. But in South Asia, the star today is Bangladesh. And, uh, you know, Bangladesh deserves credit because of rural credit, uh, involvement of community, health, education, their social parameters are far better than ours. Um, uh, coming to Sanjeev's uh, questions, uh, farm laws, stakeholders, yes, we needed to consult as many as we could, but the stakeholders actually took over the agitation as it were, and the biggest stakeholder were the richer farmers and the artiyas who operated behind the, uh, you know, behind the skirts of the rich farmers and the, and the, uh, 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 you know, and the uh, uh, people on strike, because they also lost a lot, the Arthiyas. Uh, the FCI, uh, agriculture policy, a huge amount of corruption in the FCI as well. Um, they, when the monsoon comes, they take about a kilo or two from the quintal bag because the bag get heavier. There's a huge racket. Rich farmers give substandard food grains to the FCI quality inspectors. And uh, we in Madhya Pradesh and Chhattisgarh, uh, we claim to be the, um, sorry, I'd just like to go back here. Um, sorry, I'm just, uh, I'm just trying to, I've got a few, I'll just remove some of these and see if I can. Um, I just let, let me see if I can, I'll just come back to this here. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. So the thing is that um, the uh, stakeholders are a wide cross section. It's more than just the richer farmers. You have the poor farmers, and the poor farmers will naturally de depend on this. But isn't the consumer also a stakeholder as well uh, in farm laws? Because uh, they are also affected by that. Independent silos, as Sanjeev pointed out, yes, very much so. Uh, uh, the old stereotypes that academics and bureaucrats have about each other. Poor implementation, yes. Traffic is a different issue because traffic is normally regarded in police circles as a kind of window of rent seeking because many inspectors lobby to come into traffic where there's like plunder without danger. So to that extent, um, the implementation tends to, tends to be a little weak. Secondly, is the Indian public that I remember uh, I learned my driving in Bombay. And when I got married, my wife was a Delhi girl. I learned to respect the rules. She was taught not to follow the rules. So when I was driving, I arrived at a red light in Delhi. So I stopped the car. So she said, carry on. So I said, look, I can see there's a red light in front of me. So she said, yes, but I can see there's no policeman around. So what happens is the culture of uh, places that tend to be different. Uh, the crisis of 1991, it happened when no one mourned because we were bankrupt. We have a saying in Madhya Pradesh, bankruptcy ke, paas hoshi, ke baad hoshiari. And people become wise. As Shakespeare said, ruin has taught me thus to ruminate. So what happens is then people obviously change and, and, they, ne and they need to change and the crisis uh, Sanjeev is spot on. It's absolutely right. It's necessary to bring about changes. Uh, LPG, well, basically liberalization, privatization is, uh, is as inevitable as death and taxes. And uh, the status quo is take the Bombay school. And I remember uh, Rahul Bajaj had in fact once stopped speaking to me once because uh, at some seminar I had said that when uh, Rahul Bajaj says India is in danger, what he means is Rahul Bajaj is in danger, uh, which was the case. But to be, uh, but to add a happy postscript which you flagged, Sanjeev, was that um, his son Sanjeev, Sanjeev Bajaj has uh, has rejected his father's dictum of protectionism. He's embraced the market and he's doing very well. 
So maybe the older generation would have to take a back seat. Uh, coming to the points uh, raised by Jyoti, she started off, of course, she talked about Bretton Woods. And yes, the Bre Bre Bretton Woods, again, with the IMF, um, see, the World Bank has been on a continuous learning curve. Some of their reports, uh, you know, read as if they've been drafted and not blocked. Uh, a few of their reports. And uh, we can see the impact of uh, people on that. Uh, the IMF have also learned a lot. Gone are the days when they were as they were the global villains for a while. But they've also grown over the years now and have become a little more flexible because ideologies have been eroded. And I believe this is for the better, all ideologies. Poor outcomes, yes. Because again, here we bureaucrats are also to blame to a degree because we're ephemeral creatures. We come and we go. And uh, the lack of public awareness, we need the public to keep an eye on us and uh, hold us to account. And if the public don't hold us to account, then we and the politicians uh, you know, in, tend to be a little uh, tardy. And the, uh, particularly the IAS and the politicians, I believe, have an unacknowledged love affair. Neither side admits to it. But the fact is that the IAS are the most dispensable bunch of individuals. If you drown the lot, then the impact on the country would be less than if you drown the postman. So the IAS is weak. And because they are weak, they are strong. The politician's nightmare is an organized department. They are riding the tiger of the police, but they're also a little scared. They're scared of the armed forces. So what happens is that uh, we are a useful counterweight and whipping boys, and we perform a certain function, and they have a high level of comf uh, comfort level with us because we work in the states with them. So they feel we understand grassroots problems, which some of our colleagues in the central services perhaps don't, many do. Uh, the bare necessities, the index, obviously our social parameters are badly skewed, and there's a great... Uh, regional uh, variation this applies to multi uh, disciplinary uh, uh, poverty as well but if you look at the social structure uh, i just flagged two issues one is i believe that uh, india is a racist society uh, because um, we uh, and caste i believe is a form of race when i raised this issue as secretary of social justice i was told to keep my mouth shut and uh, not uh, you know, oppose governments, but which was that no racism exists. But certainly, uh, the Rig Veda talks about the unclean nature and the dark dasyus accompanied by a pejorative. So, um, to be uh, dark in India is not really too much of a bonus. You had uh, fair and lovely cream, and I've been asked in international lectures. I lectured the Centre for Parliamentary Studies in London. So, it, does it work? So I said, I don't know it appears to be because some men are also applying it as well. But what we call the whitening of India. Now, we men are somewhat redeemed by Lord Krishna, who is a darky like I am. But for the women, it's very difficult. Wanted fair and beautiful bride for group one government officer. And uh, so what happened? This is changing very gradually. And as far as our race structure is concerned, I've been reading a bit about, you know, about uh, the uh, nomads. And uh, the fact is that uh, we Indians are a mix of races. We have Australoid, Mongoloid, Negroid. I suspect that I have my fair share of both because Jats are supposed to be descendants of the Huns. And the Huns are the Songnui in Northern China. So what happens is you take a gene map of any Indian and you will find all the races, including the Jarewas. Uh, the Jarewas, we thought they were Australoid, but then I learned that no, they have the same racial mix as us. It's just a question of tweaking one or two genes here and there. Uh, so as far as poverty is concerned, uh, we find there's a link between also and the status of women between agriculture and uh, the status of women. Rice is a woman's crop. Wherever rice is grown, women tend to have a higher status because the men are largely redundant. They can help in preparing the fields, but the, whether it's broadcasting or transplanting uh, uh, paddy and uh, thinning or weeding of paddy and even the harvest, you don't really need the men. 
And this is one reason why in Chhattisgarh and MP where I've worked particularly, the men push off for seasonal migration once the fields have been prepared for the paddy crop. They're not required. So uh, generally rice, uh, uh, traditionally rice growing countries have a better status of women with two notorious exceptions, three of them. One is uh, Japan, one is South Korea, and one is the rain shadow area of Tamil Nadu, the old Ramna district. But apart from these areas, women enjoy a social status. Islam has nothing to do with women's status. Bangladeshi women are more liberated than uh, Pakistani well women and those in the Middle East because uh, then agriculture patterns have also a factor, also impact on culture. JNY and uh, what is called Manrega, it is a useful program you need. It does provide employment, it's a cushion, and the focus should be on providing sustainable resources, which means tweaking your labor capital ratio if you need bridges or culverts, because then the roads don't get built. But otherwise, it is an important and, and will remain so. Uh, as far as selling a policy is concerned, we are salesmen. In fact, all of us are salesmen. Academics are salesmen. Bureaucrats should be salespersons because you sell an idea. And uh, we need to do that. And we need to recognize this as one of the essential inputs of a, a policy maker and a policy implementer. They must be sold. And Swachh Bharat was sold. The farmers uh, thing was not effectively sold. Um, Narsiman 1, Narsiman 2, yes, uh, and also the Malotra report on uh, insurance. These, there's a huge time lag because people were not willing to build the cat. And I would say that the public sector banks were very often the biggest obstacle and the LIC obstacle to reform because they were status quo. And uh, it's only with the banks being shaken. And uh, of course, when the UPA 2 and uh, uh, NDA 2 are compared. The fact is that UPA 2 did bankrupt the treasuries and bankrupt the banks for a variety of reasons. Um, then, of course, the, uh, uh, the roadmap for capital account convertibility. Uh, we have been cautious, perhaps rightly so. Uh, when the global financial crisis took place, we as initially escaped the worst effects because of two or three reasons. Well-capitalized banks cautious global macroeconomic policies, the huge Indian market and the benefits of black money. The benefits of black money also shielded us from some of the worst effects initially. Uh, the, uh, uh, so as far as the future is concerned, I would simply say that uh, we should, in spite of you know, the uh, so-called base effect with COVID, um, the consensus, and Dothi can throw more light on this, that the consensus would be maybe a 6.5% uh, growth rate, GDP growth in the coming decade is something which people are talking about. And uh, that will come about. I don't see anything more dramatic than that. Maybe, you know, you would. So this is what we'll have to learn to live with and make the best of our resources. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Chavi, I see a couple of questions. Would you like to, to read those or do we take those? Uh, yes, thank you, ma'am. Uh, by your permission, I can read the uh, questions. Sure. There are two questions. First is by Rose Adam, who yes. asks, what happens to public policy when governments since a long time have been using the ED, CBI, CID, police, etc., yes. to gag opponents' views? Yeah. Uh, well, I think that the government has to be brought in line and only the electorate can do that. But the fact is that when go governments have a brute majority, then the uh, CBI, the ED and others, they act as uh, caged parrots and um, uh, misuse their powers in order to you know, please the government. This is unfortunate, but true. But I believe that these are not long lasting. And uh, the CBI and the others do perform a lot better when there's uh, not a brute majority of a government. And therefore, we need a strong opposition. So that rose, I think, is the, uh, is the problem, that most governments with a brute majority tend to misuse these agencies. 
sad but true yes sir. Uh, so another question is about uh, the farm bills um, as the pm had said while uh, rolling back the uh, farm laws uh, he said that these are being repealed in the national interest mm -hmm. so now people are also talking about rolling back of the new education policy mm -hmm. so does this farm farm bill roll back offer mm -hmm. a weak point which may be seen as an example of success of the opposition in any case the farmers and the students in the above cases stand to be negatively impacted uh, what are your views sir uh, they do very different bills i believe that uh, as far as uh, you know the public interest is concerned the public interest might have been served in having the farm laws uh, being implemented in, in a proper way so obviously the statement by the pm was not actually you know not a really accurate statement but uh, coming to the uh, new education policy you see the the monsters were the uh, in the education sector was the controlling agencies the uh, uh, as i mentioned that the the uh, the rent seeking outlets for the mhrd were the ugc the aict and the nct so and their uh, you know their empires are being weakened somewhat with the new education policy uh, so and the ashpal report and others and the national uh, knowledge commission reports so in to that extent i wouldn't really trash the education reform i don't think it will meet the same fate at all but it's a question of selling the idea to the students uh, ultimately you see market forces appearing because the question is is education a public good or a merit good now the answer is probably both because if you define a, a merit code as where the private sector are ready willing and able to enter then uh, technical higher education and uh, even secondary education perhaps in urban areas become something of a merit code but in rural areas uh, these are these are public goods because the private sector will can't and won't come in so um i would not be i wouldn't uh, stretch the analogy of the education laws with the farm laws thank you sir thank, thank you. you very much uh, sorry uh, um, Chani, thank you yes that's thank it you. sorry the simi i'm so sorry yeah simi you want to um, let me have the final word thank you very much sir it was a pleasure uh, listening to you and to and to take part in the interaction over to you simi Yes, ma'am. So I was just wondering if we could have uh, um, uh, like thirty seconds of concluding thoughts uh, by all. Uh, yes, ma'am. So may I invite uh, Jodhi, yes, yeah. Professor Jodhi? Thank you, thank you, Simi. Um, you know, policy is such a vast uh, arena, and every every sector that you talk about has its policies. But one thing that sticks is that the success of our policy depends upon the people. Uh, the way sustainability is accepted as a policy in Europe, it's going to take us a long time, maybe more than two decades, for that to really immerse in India because we are like that only. You know, I mean, we we there's a book which Rama Vijaputkar's book which says that we are like that only, and uh, I think. Uh, we need the base effect of our population to be that educated enough to be able to understand policy implications. And um, whatever is good economics is bad, bad policy or sometimes bad politics. As, as, as and whatever is, uh, yeah. you know, uh, good bad. with the policy for the economy may not be good for interest groups. Good. So lobbying obviously becomes a very uh, big issue. Uh, some areas of concern that I feel, you know, from where I come in is, uh, you know, the lack of recognition of, um, you know, policies that are very pertinent. The, the reverse migration that took place post COVID mm -hmm. needs to have a national education, needs to have a national employment policy. Sure. You have a Narega and a Narega came, I think, uh, is what took the UPA government to its height. And it's been really been mm -hmm. accepted by even the present government. Quite right. Similarly, why do you not have something for the um, urban? But being an economist, I know that there is no fiscal space. So where do you, where do you, you know, how do you balance this? So fiscal space is an absolutely essential aspect. So there is a need for a national 
okay. employment policy, which includes urban people, okay. it includes migrants, is point number one. Point number two, who do you put the problem of migrants onto? Whose doorstep? The, the urban local body? In that case, you need to change the, the functions of the urban local body if you have to empower them. Otherwise, you're, you're going to keep throwing the blame at somebody, but nobody is really responsible for it. So you may have a common ration card, but um, I think certain it's time to revisit some, some of the uh, functionaries of, of uh, how the whole economy, how the governance structures work. Um, again, uh, we keep talking about infrastructure. We keep talking about um, ur urban cities, the chaos, how cities are hidden and messy, et cetera. You have a nabad for agriculture and rural development, but you don't have a counterpart for that for urban transformation and urban development. And you say that urbanization really contributes to about 65% of your GDP, et cetera. The third thing that I'd like to I'd like to say is last thing, and then I think I've exceeded my 30 seconds of it, but I shall say it nevertheless, um, is, uh, you know, you have so much that is on paper, but where is the outcome? You know, the outcomes have to be realized. Otherwise, let's, as academicians, at least I come from that point of view, say it is a case of policy failure. Because uh, what is the timeline for a policy? You say 30% in formulation and 70% in implementation. But it is formulated in 90s. It's realized in, two zero, in, the, in the third decade of the 20th century, 21st century. So, so I think those huge lags need to be bridged. And in terms of inequity, I'd like uh, you know, a, a response, which maybe I could get from Dr. Nivedita and... Uh, uh, Mr. Baswan is that if we just time for inequalities to be corrected, then should we do away with the economics of it and say whether it is foreign exchange reserves, whether it is going in for global partnerships, borrowing, going into a debt, but seeing that the base effect is created, uh, you know, so that you have you have made livability very very standardized for everybody. Of course, it comes at a cost and it may not be um, good economics, but what's the point of having good economics 20 years from now when you don't have people with basic livability conditions? We are into 75th year of independence and therefore I think, I think that's some place that we all need to speak about. And I therefore am so happy to have this platform and be able to share my views with Professor, with Mr. Baswan and Dr. Harad. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Jyoti. Um, Professor Sanjeev, are you there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you, ma'am. And uh, 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 just to sum it and the last word, I would say that uh, uh, the political freedom that we won in 1947, uh, we did a good job in terms of uh, food security and uh, some other as aspects. Uh, democracy is the survival of the weakest. Uh, no deaths have taken place during all these years, starvation deaths and otherwise. We have been able to capture many a things. Uh, then first generation reforms came up uh, in the year 1990s. Ma'am uh, Jyoti was talking about second generation reforms took more than 30 years because uh, uh, good economics may be bad politics. And uh, uh, because of the simple reason that we had uh, consolidated, uh, we had government from different parties, especially state governments, uh, state parties had become stronger uh, to the detriment of the one single party that was uh, Congress. But now, uh, since now we have two parties, so things have come up and government is uh, willing to take the bite. I think 73rd, 74th Amendment, I think we missed it out. Uh, that's, that has been a great uh, reform uh, policy in terms of uh, bringing uh, political uh, freedom to the grassroots levels and especially 50% reservation for the women now. We see it in Punjab, Haryana and Kerala is one such example, wherein now a lot of work is being done, a lot of empowerment has come up because of 50% sarpanches and they are moving up to the political chain also. Other one thing I think we uh, talked less was GST reform. GST reform is one such reform in terms of financial part, which has the uh, potential to transform into India into a big, big economic powerhouse. Already in COVID times, we are getting 1.43 lakh crore, 1.40 lakh crore monthly uh, during the last three, four uh, months. 
and i think uh, i see it to raise around 2.5 lakh crores when things become okay that means 30 lakh crores 30 lakh crores just from gst collection and uh, keep please note that alcohol and petrol is out of this so we'll be a economic powerhouse because all good nations who are economically powerful they tend to you know in democracy as especially the kind of democracies we have then it will be distributed to all third thing i would say that we talk much we don't do much and herein it is the uh, it is the uh, i will point fingers at educated people mostly uh, we don't vote uh, when political parties come to us let's say we are having uh, elections in uh, chandigarh uh, 24th tomorrow that is mc elections people come to us we don't ask them what have you done in 5 years we will stone yuvraj singh's house if he don't hit a six on the last ball to win a match but we never ask them what have you done during the last 5 5 years and somebody who asks them he becomes a sort of a loner in the entire society that i've seen in my society this is happening uh, we need to question people and i think one word out of this is that if we devote 10% of our time and 10% of our money on social part i think uh, 130 crore population is enough to take all reforms into one thing because implementation and formulation in a democracy for the people by the people and of the people i think that is not what is happening thank you so much thank you i think both the discussants have i agree with all that you say uh, you've made extremely important points i just end by mentioning something that was not uh, touched upon today and that is the future of the country um i i have the examples of uh, whether it is uh, japan or china or even russia present russia or the former ussr i think they all uh, became economically and socially powerful uh, only when they had something akin to an atmanirbhar nirbharta and i think that is very important for india i think we have to uh, take that seriously Uh, the self reliance is important and uh, of course uh, in in the proper manner and uh, i think that should be uh, taken very very seriously i would not go any further thank you sir you. mr baswan it's yeah. yours uh, okay uh, 30 seconds i'll try and uh, you know uh, finish as quickly as i can um urban local bodies jyoti flag this i uh, i the urban areas we don't have an urban lobby because we have many municipal bodies municipal corporations but we don't have a unified urban lobby uh, that is an and therefore no public policy pressure comes on us for urban development this again is i think important as far as local bodies are concerned dr ambedkar had his reasons valid ones for not empowering the panchayats but today and if i am an mla the main source of my income is a transfer industry or doing something else my patronage if there is a strong local body whether urban or rural i tend to lose out and chief ministers depend on the mlas and the present political setup local bodies they want to strangle them at birth or supersede them and appoint the collector as the administrator so what happens is the political level at the states do not want local governments they have successfully sabotaged everything chief ministers who made the reforms their work was undone by other chief ministers uh, ashok mehta uh, and uh, uh, and his successor it was uh, this chap who finished them timan bai patel ramakrishna hegde for certain reasons supported decentralization bangarappa finished it Uh, Yashwant Rao Chavan wanted it, but Vasant uh, uh, Dada Patil and Charit Pawar finished it. So the default is no local governments. Uh, outcome social legislation takes years. Yes, society takes years. We abolished sati in what 1832, and it uh, it took place till recently. We abolished untouchability, but the social legislation is only one step in a fairly long movement. so quick results in are uh, in i mean are are, are too much to really expect as far as inequality is concerned yes we have piketty piketty highlighting this issue a high 
uh, Gini coefficient harms in the economy, yes, yet. But uh, I remember what A.O. Hirschman said. Virtually he said that uh, balanced growth can be a contradiction. Either you balance or you have growth. You can't have both. Maybe there could be uneven development. Maybe one follows the other. The jewelry is out on that. Uh, Sanjeev's point, reservation for women, yes. Thank goodness at least that vote bank has now woken up. And uh, as far as uh, Sarpanches are concerned, they're in a fairly bad. If DST, a game changer, if we add alcohol and petroleum products, it will certainly help. And holding leaders to account, the ballot paper is in your hands and you can certainly ask them awkward questions. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Simi, over to you. Yes, thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. And this was so fascinating and uh, really loved the entire uh, program and the conversation. So I would like to propose the formal vote of thanks on behalf of IMPRI Impact and Policy Research Institute. Um, a veteran practitioner and intellectual of an extraordinary caliber and excellence, Mr. Bhartendra Baswan, sir. We thank you from the bottom of our hearts for uh, delivering this important lecture on public policy drivers. We are really inspired. I would also like to thank Professor Jyoti Chandiramani and Dr. Sanjeev Chadda for your participation and for sharing your thoughts so lucidly, enriching the program very, uh, further. Um, and our deepest gratitude to the chair of the session, Dr. Nivedita Haran. Ma'am, it is always an honor and an honor to, for us to have you amidst us and uh, to be mentored by you. Thank you so much. And I hope that um, we will be uh, able to continue our engagement on this important discussion further in the coming days as well. Uh, lastly, I would also like to thank um, all our participants here on Zoom and also those who, who are watching us live on Facebook and to all those who would be watching us later on YouTube and listening to the program on uh, our different podcasts. So thank you so much and I wish you all a very a Merry Christmas and an inspiring and expansive New Year 2022. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all very much. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.